I, I should mention that uh, Professor Rajaram was uh, very bravely come here despite running very high fever till yesterday and uh, you know so I'm really delighted that uh, you know there are very few people who can do justice to this journey of RRI and uh, Professor Rajaram is one of them. So I introduced him so I will briefly again mention uh, he studied physics at Vivekananda College and Institute of Technology in Chennai, then did his PhD at the National Aerospace Laboratory in the areas of optics and crystallography. He joined Raman Research Institute in 1975 and worked on a range of topics, optics, condensed matter, image processing, gravitational lensing, gravitational dynamics, um, he probably there should be a cosmology and everything added to it. I mean, I can't think of anything that he doesn't cover. Uh, in the year 2000, he moved to Pune as the center director of NCRA. And uh, then he retired from TIFR in 2013 and taught undergraduate students first at ISA Pune till 2021 and then at Azim Premji University. He's currently the visiting professor a visiting professor at the ICTS TFR. During his career, he has made extended academic visits to top research groups, and he is a fellow of all the three science academies of India, has served as editor of physics and astronomy journals of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and in particular from 2015 to 2017, he was the chief editor of Resonance, the journal of science education and has written many articles on topics in physics and astronomy for the journal. So let me invite Rajaram to deliver his. Thank you, uh, Tarun. Uh, more formally, uh, members of the Council of the Institute, the RRI Trust, uh, well-wishers from other institutions and uh, members of the RRI itself. Uh, it's a great privilege to be uh, asked to talk about the journey of RRI. It's also uh, a difficult task because it's such a long journey, but a good place to begin. Can I have the next slide? would be with the Raman era. Uh, I have chosen to begin it in 1948, but in fact, uh, uh, Professor Raman had already obtained this uh, gift of this land from the Mysore Maharaja, Krishna Raja in the Vadayar, and uh, started construction. In those days, even Nobel laureates were retired at the age of 60, and uh, on the dot in 1948, he moved in to this uh, building. Uh, next slide. Uh, you see it in a half completed form on a barren uh, piece of land. This is the view uh, looking north. Okay. Uh, but apart from the gift of land, uh, such buildings do not come for free. Uh, and it's clearly built to last several centuries, as you can see the solid construction. So he didn't just think of some tiny thing where he could do his work. He thought for the ages. And uh, it's interesting to ask where the funds for this came. Uh, you have some clue. If you walk into that building, you will see that the Science Museum is named after Rao Bahadur uh, Motilal Hadwasya. Uh, in fact, <laughs> some of us uh, played a joke on the librarian. We said we want a book from the Lala Raghumal Khandelwal Science Library and he went around looking for the library but that was the library he was sitting on. So perhaps <laughs> when we complain that businessmen are not giving money for to us to do science, it is simply because we are not of the caliber and charisma of C. V. Raman. Okay. So uh, let's take another view looking west. Uh, this is not a view you can have today because you wouldn't be seeing green around the Raman Institute. Uh, that's Savan Durga, as you can see, and that is uh, the Indian Institute of Science Tower. 
In fact, Professor Raman used to joke, only half in jest, that he planted those eucalyptus trees in order to block the view of the Indian Institute of Science Tower. So clearly the parting in 1948 was not completely amicable. Uh, in any case, it, it, if you think about it, it's a miracle that yes, he moved into this building, but there was no electrical power. Uh, there was none of the equipment that he had at IRC. But he was able to carry out research with, uh, and research students flocked to him. Okay. Uh, there is a saying that one should not work in an area of science unless one has an unfair advantage. And uh, Raman's unfair advantage in this case was his collection of minerals, a faithful assistant who would stand and shine sunlight on those minerals uh, and uh, study them with cross polaroids. That's how they began, of course. Certainly more sophisticated things were done later. But uh, uh, it's also recorded that he had extraordinary vision in a very literal sense. Uh, so. Uh, so now let's uh, look at some of his uh, research students from this era. Uh, so uh, first, on the extreme left, you have uh, D. Krishnamurti, who uh, worked on uh, some beautiful uh, phenomena of iridescence and the colors. Okay, you can see many of these in the museum. Uh, then uh, uh, third from left is A. K. Ramdas, who uh, uh, went on, who did spectroscopy, and then went on to become a, a very distinguished solid-state spectroscopist at uh, Purdue University, had a long career. Behind him, you see uh, Padmanabhan, who was uh, this dedicated, trusted, versatile assistant to Professor Raman, who did everything uh, that was needed to back up whatever was happening, everything except glass blowing and electronics, which is the province of K.T. Balakrishnan, who is not standing here, right? So next is uh, M.R. Bhatt, who after doing <laughs> minerals here, seems to have taken to nuclear physics and served the Atomic Energy Commissions of the Uni uh, of United States and Canada. Uh, next to him is A.J. Raman, who passed away very recently, uh, stayed here very long, till I think 1963. Uh, uh, and then actually uh, made a completely new and brilliant career for himself at Bell Telephone Labs in the physics of high pressure, right? Uh, then uh, next to him you have uh, uh, Vishwanathan, K.S. Vishwanathan, uh, whom I actually uh, did meet in NAL, but he later on uh, moved to uh, Kerala University and set up uh, the first department of space physics, quite appropriate, since uh, ISRO had a center right there. Okay, You will see that I have omitted two of the bespectacled people standing in this picture uh, because they pertain to the other unfair advantage which uh, C. V. Raman had. Uh, next slide. The unfair advantage was his younger sister, Sita Lakshmi, who had uh, uh, five sons with a 60% successful rate of producing outstanding uh, physicists. So, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, the one in the middle is Ramaseshan, who was my own uh, PhD uh, supervisor at NAL. Okay. Uh, to his left is S. Chandrasekhar, uh, not to be confused with his cousin S. Chandrasekhar. So, uh, to make the distinction, one either says liquid crystal Chandrasekhar or Shivaramakrishna Chandrasekhar. And he will certainly come into this story later. Uh, to his right, is S. Pancharatnam, uh, who will unfortunately not come into the story later uh, in person because he, uh, after a brilliant PhD in RRI, uh, service in Mysore University and uh, work in new areas, uh, just emerging areas of resonant interaction between atoms and light uh, in Oxford, passed away prematurely at, uh, uh, in 1969. Uh, uh, he was undoubtedly uh, Raman's favorite student and uh, have devoted the next slide to his work. So on the right, <laughs> you can see that you can buy a mineral called iolite, even in Amazon, and it seems to have some mysterious properties of healing. But as far as uh, Pancharatnam was concerned, uh, C. V. Raman had told them that this shows some phenomena which are not understood. 
and uh, you know if you may even be led to new principles and uh, sure enough when he saw this pattern on the left uh, i will not enter into the technical details but basically wherever you see uh, uh, darkness it means that the two waves which propagate in that particular direction in the crystal are cancelling each other out and wherever you see light it means the two waves are in step or in phase as the optics people say so uh, pancharatnam had to understand phase and how the, could the phase difference uh, which uh, form a spiral pattern like this and in this investigation he was led to a new concept which is now part of the vocabulary of optics pancharatnam phase but uh, i have to confess that it did not immediately uh, enter the vocabulary of optics it lay dormant for 30 years uh and uh, i will say a little more about that later um once all the birds had flown from the nest in the early 60s uh, uh next slide uh, uh professor raman uh was really left on this campus with his devoted assistants he concentrated on working on color vision and uh, he was increasingly uh isolated from despondent about indian science and indian scientists there's even a board which i think is kept somewhere which was put saying the visitors are not welcome <laughs> this is the place of research but in spite of all this uh, uh, mood he was ever ready to meet the younger generation here he is uh, going around uh, with children on the campus uh, and i myself uh, uh, heard him in a summer school in uh, national college when professor narsimhaya called him he readily came and talked to us okay uh, inspiring talk uh, and on the campus of the uh, on the convocation address of the indian institute of technology okay uh, in any case the raman era came to an end on november 21st uh, 1970 next slide and uh, the other era began in fact on that particular day i happened to be in nal as a research student of uh, professor ram sejan the news came that uh, he had passed away and all of us didn't wait for an invitation we streamed into this campus and there in that location uh, there was the funeral pyre <laughs> and uh, the mood in that city every walk of life was here was that a giant had passed away okay um soon after that efforts started you just heard the secretary of the department of science and technology so uh it was a young department at that time and uh, uh many of the eminent figures in indian science uh, went to him went to the prime minister went to the dst and went to the prime minister to say this institute can now uh have a rebirth by inviting outstanding scientists to head it and to work in it okay um so uh, the next picture shows you the person who lit the funeral pyre uh this is a little earlier in 1960s when he was at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory of the California Institute of Technology um and this is a somewhat rare picture but it brings out Uh, his main characteristic which continued till his last days he loved to build things he loved to fix things and uh, uh, that never changed okay so this is uh, v radha krishnan you notice he used the full expanded form of his father's name uh, again the legend has it that when he went to loyola college uh, it's true he was a relative of raman like the two people the three people you saw who worked with him but they of course were clearly associated with raman in his case uh, it was the opposite he was asked uh, what's your father's name he said venkat raman what is profession teacher so he tried to remain anonymous and you know distant from this legacy but the legacy caught up with him and uh, he was uh, invited to come here as uh, uh, the director he took up the other person who was invited here was uh, uh, Shivaram Krishna Chandrasekhar who had uh, after his work on optical rotation here with Raman had continued that with Bragg uh, in Cambridge had also got into crystallography and then 
uh, he decided to uh, strike out in a totally new field at the University of Mysore. It made the perfect choice because it was new, it didn't, it required certainly some equipment, it required very good students. This was the field of liquid crystals just emerging as at the shadowy borderline between the solid and the liquid. He had already established a good name for himself in Mysore. In fact, I remember this because I was uh, in NAL, I heard a talk by Chandrasekhar on the optics of liquid crystals. And again, uh, uh, Ramaseshan was not the kind of person who told his PhD student, go and work on this problem. He said, go and find a problem. So, uh, I was fascinated by this. I saw some analogies with neutron diffraction and I took up this field and I have Chandrasekhar to thank <laughs> for introducing me to this topic. Uh, so, uh, in fact, he sent an advance guard uh, to this building. I remember walking in and uh, seeing Shashidhar and Vatsudhana <laughs> sitting there right, to start off the activity. He himself came later, Radhakrishnan came in 1972. So let me uh, go over some highlights. Uh, you notice that I date my acquaintance with the Raman Institute from 1970, even though I joined in 1975. And, and the reason is that since I was working in the area of the optics of liquid crystals, I was welcomed into the liquid crystal lab. Uh, and uh, they were just gearing up for an international meeting at which all the giants of the subject were going to come here. It's one of my uh, remarkable memories of that period. Uh, one of the giants, uh, Pierre Dijen, later on won the Nobel Prize and he was literally a giant because he could stand in the board of that auditorium and start writing on the top left-hand corner and finish his lecture. Okay. And, uh, that meeting was memorable for me personally. Uh, I, the lab was humming with activity. So many of these new results were presented there. And for me personally, uh, something I had just worked out as a piece of theory in my chapter was taken up by K. Suresh. And uh, it's, it's like a remarkable phenomenon in which uh, uh, the liquid crystal would absorb light at any wavelength, but at a particular wavelength, the light would manage to slip through something called the Burman effect. So he would take these spectra, I would come and collect them, go to NAL, <laughs> measure them on some machine, which RRI did not have, come back and given to Suresh. Meanwhile, uh, his colleague UD Kinney would give me some computer outputs. So I had the good fortune of being a co-author on two of the papers. So I will not forget that. And even earlier, after Radhakrishnan arrived, uh, there was a summer school in radio astronomy. You know, I wasn't doing radio astronomy, uh, but uh, my uh, thesis supervisor said, go and listen to these people. And uh, later on, I learned that these were again the giants of the field. Okay. So when I actually joined, I, I was uh, asked to sit in the main building and uh, the budgetary head under which my salary came was called uh, Cosmic Physics, which is why I have put it in quotes. And uh, my colleagues were uh, Rajinder Bhandari, who had worked on quantum solid state and uh, Chandrakant Shukre, who had worked on uh, uh, particle physics. And uh, soon after, we were joined by G. Srinivasan, who had again worked on condensed matter and uh, Haridas who had worked on particle physics. And the interesting thing was none of us were trained in astronomy. But clearly, cosmic physics suggests that we were being pointed towards astronomy. So no one told us what to do. So I think Rad would uh, sort of drop in and <laughs> ask some searching questions and uh, maybe tell us about some new developments or bring in some exciting visitors who would give some talks. And uh, in this uh, very interesting way, he, he sort of uh, converted us uh, to astronomy. Uh, in fact, it's all the more remarkable because uh, all of us, uh, materialists mainly, were used to thinking in terms of mathematics and in equations and Rad's own style was very different. But uh, we slowly learned that uh, if he made some statement which looked very qualitative or intuitive, there was actually a lot of deep thought behind it and we better take it seriously. <laughs> okay. So in this way, uh, I think some, in uh, another occasion I said he took up the job with missionary zeal of building up astronomy, literally a missionary because he did a certain amount of conversion of all of us, right? Uh, so there were uh, very nice summer schools here. 1976 is memorable because it was astronomy and it was a collaboration with many institutes. Uh, Professor Govind Swaroop of the UTI group initiated it, but then uh, Vainubapu, uh, 
uh, Professor Kasur Rangan gave a talk there, I do remember. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, at least uh, half a dozen of the people in that summer school uh, took to astronomy. Uh, hopefully, we inspired them to do so. 77, uh, Chandrasekhar arranged a summer school in physics. And again, <laughs> some of the people in that summer school went on to outstanding careers. I, I do hope that RRI revives this uh, tradition. Maybe it already has. Uh, plasma astrophysics, again, uh, more close to astrophysics. And there again, this uh, uh, conversion strategy came. Uh, Professor Swaroop just walked into the room and said, uh, Radharam, you will read up on recombination lines and give some lectures. I had no idea what recombination lines were, but I read up on it. And I also learnt that one of our visitors, uh, Peter Shaver, had made some predictions that these could be observed with the UT radio telescope. And that was taken up by Anantaramaya, one of the uh, students. And uh, perhaps all this inter-institutional uh, mingling, which uh, took place on this campus, led to uh, something called the Joint Astronomy Program at the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, uh, which is remarkable because the physics department did not have a single astronomer and yet uh, they were persuaded by the director, perhaps Professor Dhawan, to say astronomy is very important and uh, uh, let us get into it by uh, admitting students, conducting lectures for them for one year because you don't learn much astronomy uh, in your masters. Uh, let all these institutions contribute. Uh, so, this started in 1982 and I have to say that the people who uh, joined the Joint Astronomy Program are probably better astronomers than all of us because uh, they had the benefit of listening to the expert of, on stars, about stars, the expert on galaxies, about galaxies and so on and so forth. So, again, the uh, list of people who passed through the Joint Astronomy Program, uh, either officially or once the word got around, people would come to those lectures, whether they were part of uh, the formal enrollment or not. That reads like a who's who of uh, astronomy in uh, India. Okay. Now, meanwhile, uh, uh, in this group that I talked about, loosely called uh, Cosmic Physics, as I said, it was probably just a budgetary head because uh, we mingled with everyone. Uh, exciting things were done, which you will hear about in detail. So, I just want to convey the mood and the spirit. Uh, work on pulsars, which was of course uh, uh, something that Radhakrishnan had done pioneering work in Australia and he was very curious about it. Uh, supernova remnants, which again have to do with pulsars. The interstellar medium, uh, I think Professor G. Srinivasan was very much involved in these areas. And the last two, accretion and image processing, uh, I had some role in and I'd like to say a little more about them. Uh, it turns out that I wasn't the first research student of Ramsation to move uh, to RRI. Okay? Three years before me, uh, Professor G.S. Ranganath had uh, moved okay, uh, to the liquid crystal lab as a theoretician. Fortunately, I had enough overlap to learn enough optics from him before he moved here. But of course, we collaborated once even after that and three years after me, the next student of Professor Ramseshan, uh, by the name of Ramesh Narayan. Uh, if you look him up on the archive, you will find that he is one of the most prolific authors in astrophysics uh, today. Uh, he spent five years here, but they were very eventful five years. So, uh, in these two areas, uh, accretion and uh, image processing, again, the trigger came from having outstanding visitors. So, in the case of accretion, it was Paul Vita and in the case of image processing, uh, uh, it's a long story. Some of the pioneering work was done by C.R. Subramania at UTI, uh, which we learnt about because uh, I think Rad was probably his thesis examiner. Uh, then uh, uh, Rajendra Bhandari got into this field because there was a rather miraculous technique of image processing called maximum entropy, uh, which took very ugly looking maps produced from the raw data and produced very beautiful looking maps and uh, Rajin felt, look, you can't get something for nothing. So, he uh, tested the method and found out when it would work and when it would not. And then, uh, when we had another visitor, Max Komasarov, who came with a new way of looking at this, uh, Ramesh got into it. I mean, it was always true that Ramesh would get into it first and that ran sucked me into it later. And uh, 
uh, we were able to clarify the mystery about why this method works in uh, so ramesh of course continued to work and moved on to a distinguished career in uh, arizona and uh, harvard university where he is uh, today uh, the other group uh, which uh, of course we were all together on the same floor we talked to each other but it's worth mentioning because uh, you will be hearing about it as a distinct category from balaya is uh, uh, the group of people working on gravitation and here uh, it was seeded by professor c v visveshwara and not to overlap too much with balas talk uh, let me just say a few things visveshwara or vishu as he was known and you can see his signature in that cartoon was a, a talented cartoonist uh, his lectures uh, were deceptively simple given how uh, deeply technical and mathematical uh, the subject is and how deeply technical his work was uh, by the time he came to rri he had also done already done this uh, work in his phd thesis on perturbing a black hole uh, till then no one even knew whether the black hole was stable whether it was a meaningful solution at all and he was the first to nail it down but uh, this is the way he conveyed it uh, and then 45 years after his thesis uh, he was uh, invited to ayuka and then there was a presentation of the first detection of gravitational waves in which many of the people in ayuka uh, and i also were collaborators so this is the signal and the last part of the signal happens to be uh, something which is there in vishu's thesis quasi novel modes so this is just to convey to you uh, both what a eminent figure he was in general relativity of course he worked on many other things he attracted outstanding visitors and uh, he also uh, attracted young people so although i have also knocked on his door to clarify some of the subtle aspects of general relativity i also learned a lot from people like samuel durandar uh, balayer and you will hear more about gravitational physics uh, later so this is the picture of the so called dome building which you, which you see over there in raman's time okay you can see it's like a fortress <laughs> and it really was a fortress to prevent light from entering and also to prevent temperature fluctuations from entering because some of the most delicate experiments involving very long exposures uh, were conducted there it was a spectroscopy lab okay uh, it became the electronics lab and surely one needed an electronics lab because you know i've shown you a picture of rad but so far i have not said anything about the radio astronomy activities which uh, started here after that so one of the first activities which started was that uh, professor shastri of uh, the indian institute of astrophysics had already done some work on solar radio astronomy and he had a long standing ambition to uh, build a radio telescope at a very long wavelength there were not many such in the world at that time around 10 meters and uh, rad opened up uh, the facilities in the laboratory of rri to him uh, the atmosphere was such that we didn't even know whether people in that group belonged to <laughs> rri or uh, so those activities started in this lab uh, and then uh, next next picture you see uh, here uh, nvg sharma uh, i should mention that uh, uh, even before he came here uh, rad knew govind swarup uh, very well in fact govind relates that uh, on a visit uh, rad asked him look if i come here uh, you know i need a radio telescope at least to start with i will build my own later and govind said well uh, here is this area of uh, spectroscopy with utu telescope which we have not ensured and if you like i can reserve it for you uh, and apparently that's what happened so the recombination lines which i mentioned earlier receivers were built in uh, sharma's lab right but sharma also had this ambition uh, unlike shastri he wanted to move to very short wavelengths okay millimeter wavelengths okay and that took a long time came here in 1976 one of the interesting things he did based on the uti experience was he told us you know don't go around looking for phd's and msc's Uh, in uti we had the most brilliant results hiring people just after the bsc so many such people passed through his lab and again the results speak for themselves they did very well uh, they uh, learned electronics instrumentation un under his very watchful eye and uh, they went out uh, to many corners of the world uh, 
Uh, one uh, interesting thing is that there were these regular radio astronomy lab meetings where all these people would get together and we were all encouraged to attend them. So as a result, uh, I also attended them. Uh, I kept learning, not by actually reading any book, but by listening to people. Uh, and the deal was that, you know, I could visit any of these telescopes, Gauri Bidhanur, Uti, or even Mauritius, uh, provided it did not touch any of the hardware, okay, uh, purely as a theorist. And I picked up a lot about radio astronomy, just out of curiosity, uh, little knowing that uh, in the year 2000, I would shift to a full-time radio astronomy institution. So let me show you a picture of the millimeter wave uh, telescope. Uh, it's no longer there. Uh, its uh, lifetime is over. But uh, you can see that it's uh, quite beautiful. But let me tell you a few more things about it. Uh, at a wavelength of 2.6 uh, millimeters, you need a very, very accurate surface. Uh, the fluctuations from the parabolic shape cannot be more than a small fraction of a millimeter. I think it finally uh, turned out to be up to a quarter of a millimeter. Uh, now, Robert Layton, uh, one of the legendary figures of Caltech, a middle author of <laughs> the Feynman Lectures in Physics, had perfected the technique of making such telescopes. And thanks to the Caltech connection, he willingly shared everything about how he did the telescope. But it's one thing for Layton to make the telescope. <laughs> But uh, it is not trivial to do it here. Uh, so this was take, taken up. Again, one more NAL connection, the mechanical engineering team. And one vital part was that all the cutting of the surface was done on a parabolic rail. And to make sure it was parabolic, you had to use a laser interferometry. And interestingly, the person who was interested in quantum measurement theory, uh, Rajinder Bhandari, whom I mentioned, actually uh, took up this task. And uh, it was successful. Okay. Now, uh, in retrospect, this is not the ideal site for millimeter waves. Only a few months in a year where there is less water vapor and you can do this. And it's also true that the technology of these receivers uh, uh, advanced quite a bit. So uh, the telescope could not be competitive after a while. But there were still three or four uh, PhD theses. But as we have seen many times in the story of RRI, the people who were trained here went on to do very well. Huh? Uh, in uh, Australia, in Japan, in millimeter waves. And two of them uh, joined the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, uh, millimeter waves. And I should say that uh, uh, they were among the 347 odd authors of this uh, paper which announced the first image of a black hole, uh, which came out in 2019, because that involved working at uh, millimeter waves. Mm, I have not checked with them whether they received their fair share of the $303 million price which this discovery <laughs> attracted. Uh, in any case, uh, it felt good to see RRI people on the authors of this paper. And of course, Ramesh Narayan was very much there because the theory of this uh, involved accretion and image processing and so on. Okay. But one interesting spin-off was that this laser interferometer, which Bhandari had now become very familiar with, was used to reinvestigate this phase which Pancharatnam had discovered and which we had all forgotten about. Okay. And again, I think you will hear more about the story, but uh, this unexpected connection between completely different kinds of activities, making a millimeter telescope and, you know, investigating uh, quantum phases or something like that, is one of the uh, marvelous things which could happen and still can happen in a place like RRI if people talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I think this has brought us uh, up to uh, the 19... 90s. Of course, I was here for 10 years more, but I thought it was better to concentrate on the earlier period since many of the people here may be more familiar with the later period, uh, 90s onwards. But I do have to say one thing about uh, something which happened. In 1994, uh, Professor N. Kumar uh, took over from RAD as the director here. He came over from the Indian Institute of Science. right? And uh, the very first question he asked all of us is, this is the Raman Institute. Fine, he, he did optics, classical optics and so on. There is all this excitement in modern optics, right? Uh, 
In fact, the field where Pancharatnam saw the first basic steps, a resonant interaction between laser, between light, no lasers at that time, right? Why, why are we not doing it here? But he faced a dilemma. How, how do you do this? There is no activity going on here. Uh, why would any person join? So he found a very novel solution, perhaps very similar to the solution which Rad found for growing astronomy. On the one hand, uh, uh, there was Professor Arsinivasan, uh, an outstanding experimental physicist, uh, but not in optics, uh, in low temperature physics, at, uh, known to all of us in the community. In fact, he was my teacher at the Indian Institute of uh, Technology in uh, Madras. And at, uh, there was a farewell function for him at Indore when he was retiring. So Kumar sent me with a letter, <laughs> right, and inviting him to come here. Now, he had not worked in optics, but those of you who know Professor Arsinovasan will know that his approach is simply to learn what has to be learnt and do what has to be done, and not talk about it till it's done. Of course, so he gave us uh, these very nice lectures on the theory of it, started off activity. But uh, the second step which Kumar took is also interesting. Uh, I used to sit in a room over there, and one of the desks was reserved for uh, people from the Gaudi Bidhanur Observatory, right? And the person sitting there was called Hema Ramachandran. She was actually a member of the BARC and she would normally have continued doing high pressure physics at BARC, but uh, uh, she got married and the husband was here. So BARC said, look, if you want to go to Bangalore, the only place we can put you is the seismic station. So she uh, changed her field to seismology and uh, once a week she would come and sit here. Uh, then one afternoon, uh, she received a summons from Professor Kumar, so she walked down that corridor and she later told me she thought she was going, going to be told to vacate that desk. Instead of which, he offered her a position to initiate activity in modern optics, again a field in which she had no training whatsoever. So in any case, this uh, catch-22 situation was broken. Uh, it was very hard uh, starting all these things, but they were fully backed. And of course, once there was a nucleus, many people were attracted around it. You will certainly hear more about this in the talk on the light and matter speciality. So I think uh, this activity, and of course, if you think of light as X-rays and radio waves and so on, all those things have justified the title of uh, G. Venkatraman's book. Uh, the journey of RRI has been, among other things, a uh, journey into light. Uh, I have to apologize that this account was uh, somewhat personal and somewhat subjective. Uh, I'm aware that I might have left out many events, uh, many people, but it's not with any intention. I, I thought that uh, uh, rather than try and give an unbiased view, it's impossible to be unbiased about a place where you have spent 24 happy years. Uh, I thought it would be better to give you a first-hand account. Right? So, apologies if you didn't uh, uh, see your name or activity here. If you didn't see your picture here, there's a very good reason. It's because you are alive. Okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, in any case, uh, thank you again for this uh, opportunity to, to acknowledge and in some tiny way repay my debt to this institute. Thank you.